This is Breakthrough News, and you are watching the Freedom Side Live. I'm one of your hosts, Eugene Perrier, here alongside my co-host, Rania Kalik. Rania, it's good to be back with you here. It is so good to be back with you, Eugene. It's been so long, it feels like. I think it, it has, has been. been. So. It's been three weeks. Yeah. We, well, both of us mm -hmm. were attending to our health and various other yeah. things and events and things like that that took us away from the Freedom Side Live, but we are back as always, mm -hmm. Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, noon Pacific Time. So hopefully we will not have another long break, but we are here. We're back with you. We are both feeling good and ready to go. Yeah. Obviously, you know, as we always do on the show, there's quite a bit to talk about, a lot of it quite somber. But I will say that this yeah. is a good time to remind everyone who is watching on YouTube, I don't know where else you would be watching, to make sure you hit the subscribe button, make sure you hit the bell so that you can get the alerts because we have many fantastic things about all the various important issues we'll talk about tonight and more coming out regularly on Breakthrough News and we wouldn't want you to miss any of that. So hit subscribe, hit the bell, and if you have the opportunity to share the link to this show so whoever is following you can follow us, greatly appreciated we're going to touch a number of different things obviously the tragic situation that took place in texas uh president biden's recent trip to asia also the upcoming elections in colombia this weekend which could be quite momentous and the massive assault on women's rights that's happening here in the united states so we've got a lot for you we've got a ton of great guests so again if you can share the link now's the time to do it because we have a lot lined up for you here today and a lot to discuss and a lot of really important issues. Don't for, don't forget to subscribe. So just to jump right in, oh. we want, oh, go ahead, yeah. please, Rania. No, no, I was just saying so, yeah, to get right into it. A lot of no, issues No, we want to start discuss. with the it's first like, story out of Texas. Yeah, which is just Maybe absolutely horrific. Americans. I'd hoped when I became president, I would not have to do this again. Another massacre. Uvalde, Texas. An elementary school. Beautiful, innocent, second, third, fourth graders. <clears throat> and how many scores of little children who witnessed what happened see their friends die as if they're on a battlefield, for God's sake. Well, that was President Biden, of course, in his press conference after the news came out about the shooting in Uvalde, Texas. And, you know, I, I, I think the somber tone there is correct. I, you know, was able to see some of the quotes from one of the children who survived and some of the things that they saw and heard. Tragic on so many different levels, and there's a lot to jump into here. But before we jump into it, I think that people have seen, you know, the debate is sadly where it is oftentimes after we see these sorts of, 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 of just tragic murders taking place in these school shootings. And I think in many ways, perhaps the debate that we're in, which we've heard many times, is very well encapsulated by this clip of two gubernatorial candidates from the Republican and the Democratic Party in Texas facing off yesterday at a press conference regarding the shooting. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Sit down. You're out of, you're out of line and an embarrassment. Hey. Sit down. Get out of line. The next shooting is right now, and you are doing nothing. No. He needs to get his ass out of here. This isn't the place to talk to us over. This is totally predictable when you... Sir, you're out of line. Sir, you're out of line. Sir, you're out of line. Please leave this auditorium. I can't believe you're a sick son of a bitch that would come to a deal like this to make a political issue. Can't believe someone would make a political issue. Well, yeah, Rania, I mean, it feels like, I, I, well, I, 
I actually don't know exactly how old you are, but I know roughly how old you are. I mean, it feels, I mean, I was in eighth grade when Columbine happened. You can think of Sandy Hook. We can think of so many of these terrible school shootings in uh, Parkland. It feels like we're back where we are every time with a lot of, you know, yelling and shouting going on, a lot of righteous anger, rightfully so, a big desire to see something change, but a deep feeling that, you know, more or less, this is just until the next time is how it feels. Yeah, I mean, there's so many different ways to look at this, to talk about this, to analyze this. And of course, yeah, the first thing that comes to mind is anyone who grew up in the U.S., especially like of our generation, has certainly gotten used to the idea of every few years having to witness some sort of horrible school massacre uh, with no real like logic. Not that there ever could be logic behind it, but in mm -hmm, some right cases here. you never even know why someone did it. Like we still don't know why Adam Lanza killed like, what was it? Like 21 first graders at Sandy Hook, something like eight years ago. Um, and every time, you know, it turns into this, I think, very simplistic conversation uh, that's very partisan, that's very like, okay, Republicans love, was it, which, isn't, which isn't incorrect. The, the typical like sort of mainstream narrative is always Republicans love guns. They refuse to do any gun control. In fact, they end up using these, oppor like, these as opportunities to demand we arm like teachers and just crazy ideas for how to deal with this issue. Democrats use it to like, fundraise so we can get more Democrats, so we can get gun control legislation. And it's kind of the same conversation over and over again. Nothing changes, nothing happens. But I think there's some deeper reasons beyond just the gun control issue. Yes, guns in America need to be regulated. There are far too many guns in America. They're too easily accessible. There's all kinds of things we can talk about when it comes to gun control, gun violence, and how it happens in different parts of America. But, you know, having spent the last five years abroad, especially in very unstable countries like Lebanon that have a lot of problems, they are oftentimes war zones. They experience, you know, we like to blame this on, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's capitalism. It's inequality. It's uh, mental health. These, it's all of these things. I'm not saying none of this is true. I think it's all of these things, but there are other countries that have those same problems to a much greater degree and are flooded with weapons. I'm talking to you from one of them, but we don't have these kinds of bizarre, senseless mass shootings that like kill elementary school kids. Like there's something deeper that's wrong with American culture and society that's contributing to this because everyone in Lebanon has guns. There are guns all over Yemen. There are guns all over Syria. There's There's been extreme violence in those places and in some cases still is but it's violence with like a political purpose, right? The person who's committing the violence is telling you why they're doing it. Doesn't make it okay, but there's some sort of comprehensible logic to it. You can say why this person did this. Whereas in America, there's this problem of like teenage boys senselessly like getting into combat gear and killing as many people they can in a movie theater or in a school or in a shopping mall. And sometimes there's a reason behind it, like what happened a couple weeks ago in Buffalo where it was like racist purposes, but other times there's not. And it's very American. So I yeah. think that there like needs to be some sort of, you know, deeper study into why this is happening over and over and over again. Cause it's not just one of these things. It's yeah. all of them and maybe more. No, I, I, I hear you. I mean, it really is. I, I certainly hear the last thing you're saying is I feel that I always feel that there's such a there's there's such a lack of a desire to try to look sort of at a in a holistic way and sort of work sort of from root causes out. I mean, there's supply and demand issues, right? I mean, I think obviously a demand needs a supply, so the issue of guns is relevant. But the reverse is also true, that sort of the things that are driving it. And I mean, there's so many different pieces, and I want to say something about that. But the other thing I also want to raise, and you mentioned this at the beginning, Rania, is, you know, the conversation around, well, we just need more school security guards, we need more cops and different mm. things of that nature, which, you know, armed teachers, blah, 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 which, of course, is what the Republicans are, are heavily driving and pointing to yet again. But I mean, one of the other big controversies about what we saw happen is the police, where it essentially appears that the, you know the 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 young man went there. Uh, I think his name is Salvador Ramos. Uh, 
He was able to evade some of the cops that were already there, and then he barricades himself in this classroom. And then, of course, I think many people, I, I, we're not going to play this video. If you want to go look for it, look for it. But I, I think it's not necessary. But, you know, the video that's been released, it's all over the Internet of the parents who are outside of the school. You know, some of them want to go in the school. The police are preventing them from going in the school, but they themselves are refusing to go into the school. And I, I've been talking about this with people, you know, since yesterday, but it just sort of seems like, you know, when it comes down to just like murdering innocent people, the police are, are, are very adept, it seems, at just gunning people down for no reason. And it's always couched in this language of we have to protect ourselves and protect and serve and the police put themselves out there and so on and so forth. And that seemed to be the opposite of what we saw. Now, of course, it hasn't all unfolded. We've seen a lot of anger from parents who, of course, were there. We're seeing a lot of questions raised about why the police were just basically seemed to be kind of standing around. And then it takes the Border Patrol Special Forces, BORTAC, to show up. And then, you know, they're trying to cut through the door and they find a key. I, I mean, it just seems that there's such a mythology around the ability of the quote unquote good guys with guns, the police and security guards and others to solve all of our problems. And then we consistently see in these situations that they're either they're either not there or when they are there, they're unable to really address it in any way, shape, or form that that is significant and saves people's lives. And, you know, this is Governor Abbott, of course, said, well, they did save some lives, just not enough. But I think that's that video is really infuriating to watch. I think a lot of people are rightfully upset. And I think a lot of parents are asking serious questions about what took place. And I think it just goes to the folly of, of so much of the discussion around how just having a bigger, badder, more prevalent set of armed forces is, is not is not going to get us to where we need to go. And it's more likely, honestly, to victimize other people than to address it. But I, I think that's that in and of itself, I think, exposes so much of the mythology around around policing that exists in this country, it, which in and of itself speaks to the deeper problem of violence and the things that exist here. I mean, we titled the show United States of Violence. I, I don't want to go on and on here, but I, I mean, there's multiple gun violence issues in America, you know, and they're, they're, they're both overlapping and separate. I mean, obviously we had the Buffalo shooting and we know what that was about. You know, I mean, we understand the long history of genocidal racism, uh, the genocide of the Native Americans, slavery, Jim Crow, the vigilante violence of the Ku Klux Klan and other associated type groups, and the long history of violence that is, you know, done by white people against non-people in the United States. Like that that's a, a, a vertical that exists. We have these school shootings, which, you know, don't necessarily have to be separate, but often are sort of a separate discussion and their own kind of lane in terms of what it says about the, I think, as you said, Rania, kind of the, the cultural, spiritual, you know, vacuousness of the country where we have a huge promotion of violence in certain circumstances, both abroad and at home. You know, we have like the frontier culture mentality. We have the America, you know, world police go bomb the world kind of mentality. Violence is is constantly celebrated in many, many different ways in our culture. Uh, and death is normalized in a major way in our culture. I mean, we've seen this with COVID, right? So many people who don't have to die who do die. And it's not just COVID, it's so many other things. You know, and then we have community violence that is, is, is its own thing. You know, this is, again, to point to the governor of Texas saying, well, we don't need different laws. Look at Chicago. Look at Baltimore. Look at all these other places. And, yeah, I mean, there's a truth to what he's saying, that those laws are not really addressing the issue and they're not keeping people uh, safe. And, in fact, they're victimizing the people who tend to be the most likely to be shot. But, you know, that's its own reality that deals with the economic and social destruction of whole communities, you know, through economic uh, devastation, mass incarceration, and all these other pieces. So it's all, it's like, you know, different things overlaid by a similar kind of cultural reality. And I don't really think, and we also have to talk, of course, about patriarchy and the use of guns, you know, and, and gender-based violence and violence against women, which is very significant. And until we start to deal with these greater pieces, like the Buffalo shooting, 
everyone said, well, why don't we do something about Facebook, but not about how do we uproot white supremacy? And how do we address patriarchy? How do we address the destruction of entire communities, the rise of alienation and loneliness and marginalization? And I think, as you mentioned, these, these young men, many of whom are not from economically devastated circumstances, but for whatever reason are being marginalized in a way and you know, setting up these online realities and identities and going in and doing these terrible things. I mean, it's just, I don't know. It's, I think looking for the one silver bullet answer to me, Rania, feels like the problem is that we're always saying, like, what's the one thing that's going to stop this from happening and keep kids safe and do this, that, and the third, when really it's like there's probably a list of 100 things we need to do imminently yeah. to address this issue these issues. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it's really important that you noted the sort of background a lot of these people come from is like, is this sort of like a middle class suburban background. And there's something about suburbia that is extra alienating. There's like a, an extra level of alienation where people live more online and they're sort of atomized in a very particular way in, you know, in the United States in a way that you don't see in other parts of the world. I think that plays a role in this. You know, I was reading about how the, the a lot of the, the conversations that we're having now about mass shooters used to be had about serial killers because like in the 70s 80s maybe even a bit in the 90s there was a really high rate of serial killers like that that the number of serial killers has actually gone down uh since that time but there was a lot of serial killers i think we see it reflected in the sort of true crime sort of series that we see on streaming platforms like netflix where you can go watch about some serial killer from the 80s and a, a, a disproportionate number of serial killers were in the u.s and I saw someone make the argument that the mass shooter is like the new serial killer. Uh, there's a lot of the same kind of elements of trying to understand where does this come from? Like, does this person have some kind of like psychotic gene, but also like, is it being activated by certain conditions in life? And what conditions are those? And what does it tell us about society? Like a sort of sociological look at this. And I think that's what we need. We need like, we need like an actual study into this because it's not going away. It's happening with more frequency. And it's really frustrating seeing how every time it does happen, it gets turned into a conversation about, and it, again, this is part of it. It is Democrats versus Republicans to a degree sure. for sure, but that's one element of it. Like it's not just a culture war issue. This is like an America issue. And you know, you mentioned violence at home and abroad. Well, Joe Biden in that clip that we opened with where he was commenting his first statement about uh, what happened in Texas, that statement was made after a trip to Asia to meet with various U.S. allies to basically get people on board with escalating this war against China, where, you know, he also made a comment earlier in the week to the press saying that if China invades Taiwan, the U.S. will defend Taiwan militarily. That's like the second or third time that he said that, which is a really big deal that he said that because he essentially said the U.S. is willing to go to war with China over Taiwan, which is a very dangerous thing to do. Like you're talking, I mean, you know, take Ukraine and multiply it by more. That's a huge world war we're talking about as if we're not already in one. You have this country that has over, you know, up to a thousand military bases, if not more around the world. That it, that that it's just like exacts a tremendous amount of violence to maintain this like imperialist or world order that we live in all around the world starves people, sanctions people, bombs people, kills people, steals their resources, like so much violence. It's hard to even you know explain in a sentence. And then we ask why there's so much violence domestically. Like there's there's a connection here. You don't get to be the most violent country in the world, which America is, and then not have that sort of violence at home. And there was just something really ironic about Joe Biden, as nice as his statement was, like reflecting on or pondering why there's so much senseless, inexplic inexplicable violence in the US after he was literally on a tour to warmonger against China. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. it's like, how could you not see that connection? Yeah, no, I, I think it's, there's no way it can't be connected because it's also deeply connected to the desensitization of desensitization around human life. You know, I mean, and when you're conducting these massive worldwide campaigns where you're othering people in order to, you know, conduct mass slaughter, uh, and I think the same thing is true here in the United States. I mean, 
you know, we look at the history. I mean, there's an article I, I would urge a lot of people to read. It's from well before this, but it's in the nation. Uh, the title is uh, There's No Second Amendment on the South Side of Chicago. It's about Sharon, It's by Sharon Mitchell, who is the chief public defender in Cook County that's in Chicago. And he's actually talking about a case before the Supreme Court right now that a lot of people are talking about where the what I think you could say very restrictive laws around owning handguns in New York City are – at question, and it, uh, many people feel that they're they're going to fall. And the point he's making is, you know, the vast majority of people, obviously, young black males in the South Side of Chicago, are not killing people, despite you know what Fox News is telling you. But you know, there is a lot of violence there. People are scared. They definitely can't trust the police. I mean, look at what happened to Laquan McDonald. You know what I mean? And there are many people. And I've seen this myself in places I've lived who are then illegally carrying guns because they're terrified. You know, they're afraid for their life and they want to, they know they can't trust the police and they want to just be in a situation where they feel like they have some safety. But then they get caught. They themselves are criminalized. You're in jail 10, 15, 20 years. Your life is destroyed. And so the point he's making is when we want to deal with community violence in places like Southside Chicago, places like, you know, different parts of, of, all different sorts of communities, we have to look at the root cause issues that are causing it. And we can't just criminalize people. And that's what gets lost, I think, in a lot of the debate around gun control, is it doesn't look at the different realities of how guns are used in America. I mean, I, you know, I'm from Charlottesville, Virginia. A lot of people know that. Um, you know, I talked to many people who were in that church when the Richard Spencer's forces were coming towards them. And they told me that they were very happy there was well-armed Antifa, quote-unquote, with assault rifles because that was what deterred those people from going what they felt directly into the church. And, I mean, we know who these people are and what that means. And the people I'm talking about are, like, pacifists, you know, who are telling me this. So it's not like people who are rah-rah guns, but they were, you know, rightfully people were scared. I mean, we look at what happened. Heather Hare was ultimately killed. So... You know, like that's a piece of it, you know? And so it's like when you just take this blanket, one size fits all, you end up oftentimes, you know, criminalizing and unilaterally disarming yeah. people who who have the most justified reason to have a gun, while the majority of people, and I want to play one more quip on this note, who are owning guns are owning them for the exact reasons these people are scared. We have a clip of Greg Abbott, and I want to just quickly, quickly tell people what this is about governor of Texas, he's signing into law in this video you're going to see in the Alamo, a uh, law in Texas now, permitless carry. Uh, you don't need any sort of permit to, to carry a weapon, I think even a concealed weapon. And he's talking about why you need guns. I think it speaks to the point I'm making. They fought for freedom. They fought for liberty. And that included the freedom to be able to carry a weapon. And they knew the reason why somebody needed to carry a weapon was far more than just to use it to kill game that they would eat, they knew as much as anybody the necessity of being able to carry a weapon for the purpose of defending yourself against attacks by others. Yeah. That very same principle exists today. Just look at the ranchers who live in South Texas who are being invaded on a daily basis by people coming across the border. They need to have a gun to be able to defend themselves against cartels and gangs and other very dangerous people. There is a need for people to have a weapon to defend themselves in the Lone Star State. I mean, what an amazing example, really for him to give. Like, you need to protect and to protect yourself against these hordes coming over the border. So it's like, you know what I mean? It's so much of the gun rights culture is driven by that kind of just straight up racist mentality. And I feel like that's why people get frustrated in a lot of these gun control co conversations, because it lumps those people in who want guns for all the wrong reasons with people who are in very complicated, tough circumstances uh, you know, facing fascists in their own communities where they feel unsafe. And then, so, you know, I don't know. I don't even know where I'm going, but it's all just overlaid in this one thing. But we never quite get there, you know. And I think that's the thing about it being Democrats versus Republicans is neither party has an interest in questioning is policing actually helping people? What are the reasons why people are owning guns? Why are people alienated in our society? I mean, I don't know. Let me stop ranting. Well, no, 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 no. I think you're making a really good point. And back to the issue of our police helping people, I think it's like we have to note that from what I've seen, it sounds like something like 40 percent of the municipal budget in this town where the shooting took place in Texas was going to the police department. Mm. 
and when a, and and they had trained like a couple months ago for a school shooting, which actually raised the issue, which raised the issue of they 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 trained at the shooter school, which raises the issue of well, if the school shooter is going to be a student, aren't they just seeing what the precautions taken are going to be so they can like sidestep them if they decide to be the shooter? I mean, there's a lot of holes in the way we're dealing with this, anyways, to begin with, but. Then the issue, of course, of like there's now reports. I mean, it just keeps getting worse and worse. There's now reports coming out that there were certain police officers who went and got their kids out and then came back while parents were like freaking out and saying, go stop the shooter. Um, now there's an investigation that's going to be conducted because initially they said that the police were shot at which is why they were reluctant to engage this guy when he like yeah. crashed his car. And they lied about him having body school. armor to kind of make it seem yeah, like, oh, what, exactly. what could we have done? But now it's now they're saying that they can't confirm that initial story that police were actually shot at. So it's unclear, like what was really going on here? Was this just an incredibly incompetent police department or perhaps everything we've been told about how to deal with school shooters doesn't work? Right. Like, and, and you better believe had they pulled about, him over for a traffic stop and he would have reached for his wallet, oh. they would have gunned him down in 20 seconds. Right. That definitely. Yeah. Well, you know, the other thing, too, here is, I mean, I think we need to be diligent about this because uh, there's a lot of laws that might end up on the books mm -hmm. in certain states as a result of school shootings. And those kinds of laws end up being implemented in liberal states and liberal cities. And like you mentioned, they end up just being used to criminalize and then warehouse and imprison brown and black people when like the, which a law intended to make it so that we don't have school shootings actually ends up doing that instead. So it just ends up increasing our incarceration system, increasing the number of people in it, without actually dealing with the problem. And that's what I worry about happening here is the conversation now is about this police force was incompetent. What were they doing? I hope it doesn't turn into the answer is to give them more weapons and to fund yeah. them more. Because that is, generally speaking, how sometimes liberals act in these circumstances. So we could yeah, I think that's end up seeing this result in that. Yeah, more metal detectors, which, have, by the way, have never been proven to reduce violence in schools. And, you know, you're hearing it for sure from the officials in Texas, you know, who are talking. To, I, I heard one person say maybe every school should have only one entrance and, like, no windows Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. If someone gets into that, no, nobody can leave the school. Like, what right. is this insane? And, you know, in Buffalo, too, <sighs> there was the security guard with a gun, and he did try – to do something, but you know, it's like, you know, and honestly, like, it, it, listen, I had my first gun when I was 16. I had been a gun owner for a long time. And I think a lot of people are confused about like when these kind of kinetic situations happen like this, just because you have a gun doesn't mean you're going to be able to respond in a way that you can like do something right away, do something effectively, you know, deal with someone in a standoff situation or any of these sorts of things. So it's like it, it's so besides the point. But again, I think we're going to see this for sure. This conversation about hardening schools. I, I saw a really heartbreaking thing from a guy who said that he broke down in front of his sixth grader when he was reading the news and the sixth grader to cheer him up said, well, don't worry dad we train for this and it's just like i mean what i mean we it's it, what what is going on right now in so many different ways but i think if we've been saying over and over that's the problem is we get caught in binaries we get caught in single solutions we get caught in you know pumping up the police and criminalizing the police who i guess you know i hate to say it but the reality is is we see this when we're talking about Community violence, you know, in, in East Flatbush somewhere or South Side Chicago or Baltimore, D.C., we see it in these school shootings. We see it again and again. When you need them, they don't seem to be there. Uh, and then anytime they kill someone for no reason, then the whole thing is all about, you know, their heroism yeah. and their greatness and how they're always yeah. in the, the line of fire. Where's the police brutality? Like, where it like suddenly disappears when somebody shows up dressed like Rambo, ready to like just massacre children. I mean, it's right. insane. And it also reminds me of the. Do you remember there was a shooter in um, New York City like a few years ago, and the police. This speaks to what you were saying about in a kinetic situation. Just because you have a gun doesn't mean you can actually use it properly. Yeah. So police who are actually trained to shoot. We're like running after the shooter. I can't remember where, and it was like somewhere in Manhattan. And they ended up shooting bystanders. Like they ended up shooting bystanders. Like several, it turned out like all these people were injured. Everyone thought it was by the shooter, but it ended up being by the police trying to shoot the shooter. Yeah. So yeah, you cannot solve this. Anybody telling you 
whether it's an insane like right winger, you know, Republican being like, we got to arm teachers like they have the fix. They have the solution. Anyone telling you they have that one fix, one solution from the far right to whatever liberals or whoever else, they don't have the solution because like we've just spent 30 minutes discussing, there is no one issue here. This is like a multitude of problems mixed together to create this horrible dystopic situation yeah. where it's going to take a lot more than just, I mean, and I'm not saying to be hopeless or like nihilistic mm -hmm. about this. I'm just saying we need to be realistic. This is going to require taking it seriously and having actual studies done. And you know, who's prevented studies yeah. from being done the into these industry. kinds of shootings is the gun industry yeah. because it's the last thing they want. And, if, and yeah, anyways, yeah, blame has to go on them. I mean, and listen again, I mean, I mentioned it earlier, but I I'm, you know, as someone who's been a gun owner, you have to say, when you look at the industry and the way they promote things, you know, they prey on a lot of this, you know, uh, of racism, you know, sort of aggressive testosterone filled, uh, you know, warrior style mentality. They prey on this kind of thing and they go out of their way to prevent anything that could stop them. Uh, and you know, like I said, I mean, we, we regulate so many different things, and the fact that we don't even have a lot of basic information, basic collection, and even the most simple regulations are out there, some of the blame has to go on them. But look, we could talk about this all day long, and we could talk about this for weeks, we and I hope we can elevate the level of debate. Obviously, we'll keep bringing you different perspectives on this, um, but I really I really do want to recommend, again, uh, that, that piece by Sharon Mitchell. But we're going to switch gears here. Obviously, we've been talking Wait, about violence. What's before that? we switch, before we switch, before we switch, I just want everyone to see my BT mug. Thank you, Rania. I appreciate that. <laughs> Normally, you don't have one. We got Rania a mug. We also I'm got her a so shirt excited. as if, like, she didn't work here. She didn't have any swag. Um, I got to have swag. And now I can, I know I have water to drink. I just want a product <laughs> place over here. Let me, we, I got to, like, do it so want, it doesn't, I, absolutely I'll figure out the microphone hydrated. situation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you <laughs> for modeling that, Rania. Um, yeah, you're welcome. Well, we want to switch gears slightly, <laughs> but not fully. Uh, sadly, we're still talking about violence, war, the possibility for even more war and, you know, worldwide destructive nuclear war. And now we're shifting to East Asia, the issue of the U.S.-China rivalry. And we are very happy, very honored to be joined by Dr. Ken Hammond, who's a professor of East Asian and Global History at New Mexico State University, founding director of the Conf Confucius Institute at New Mexico State, and also an activist with Pivot to Peace. Ken, thank you so much for being with us. Oh, Glad to be here. Got it. There, perfect. Got to turn my mic. Perfect. Right, right? Yeah. <laughs> this is the times we're living in, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ken, a lot has been happening. Obviously, just before we came on, really, uh, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken also discussing uh, sort of U.S. policy towards Taiwan. And, and I guess th what I want to start here with, from your perspective, is the U.S. is now insisting that Biden's comments that the U.S. would be militarily involved if, if there was a conflict um, in Taiwan, you know, they would challenge China militarily. The U.S. is saying, well, there's no change in our posture. Everything's the same. Um, this isn't anything alarming. You know, don't look over here. It's all fine. Uh, is, is that true? I mean, were this just, just a gaffe that was walked back or is there something more deeper here? Well, it's, if it's a gaffe, it's the third example of this. He's done this a couple of times before where he's made these off-the-cuff comments about uh, U.S. military engagement with China, direct military engagement with China over the Taiwan situation. And then, they, you know, his spin doctors have to, have to walk it back. So, uh, you know, to say it's a gaffe, I mean, you know, fool me once, that's, that's my problem. Uh, or your problem. Fool me twice, it's my problem. And, and fool me three times, it's all of our problem, you know. So I think that, that the idea that, uh, you know, that this is just, they, they want to trot out this concept of, of strategic ambiguity. Uh, but what's clear is that President Biden has a lot of ambiguity himself in, in his ability to articulate the American position. I think that he, he says things that, that come into his head at a certain point. He maybe doesn't remember exactly what the policy actually is. Uh, you know, once he's out there speaking, he doesn't have somebody who's feeding him his lines. And he says things that then have to be, have to be spun uh, in a way that uh, that gets them back to the actual formal legal commitments 
of the American government, which are to the one China, one China policy, uh, the idea that Taiwan is part of China. There's only one China. Taiwan's part of it. Everybody on both sides of the straits agrees to that. Uh, there's some dispute over who the actual government is, but the vast majority of countries in the world recognize the People's Republic. So uh, I think that that you know the this is dangerous to have uh, Biden going around saying these kinds of things. It only ratchets up an already uh, overly tense situation that American politicians have created. Uh, but I, I I don't think it really reflects a deep rethinking of American policy because American policy has been hostile and aggressive for years now. Uh, but it, it, it reflects some, how shall we say, some looseness uh, in controlling the message. You know, Ken, also, uh, just before Biden made these comments, there was this piece that came out in Politico speaking to various unnamed officials inside the Biden administration, talking about how they are essentially encouraging Taiwan to take a page from the Ukraine playbook. Uh, and they're even beginning to change their strategy and how they arm Taiwan. They're actually telling Taiwan, we're not going to give you these weapons anymore. We're actually going to give you these weapons in case there's a Ukraine scenario, meaning like anti-aircraft, stinger missiles and, and things like this, rather than the sort of, I guess, like fighter jets that they've previously given Taiwan. And so I guess, you know, what was really concerning about this is they were essentially saying that we want to see your country destroyed, or we want to see your territory destroyed. They're essentially saying the Taiwanese should start preparing for some sort of actual hot war with China, where they'll have to sacrifice themselves against China. They're even trying to argue to the Taiwanese that they need to like bring back some sort of conscription because they don't have enough people in their armed forces. I mean, this was a really alarming. Uh, this was really alarming to see, just because. This would mean, you know, especially if you have Biden saying, oh, we're going to militarily intervene if uh, China invades Taiwan. So to have them actually preparing for a real life scenario where they'd be like sacrificing the Taiwanese the way that they're sacrificing Ukrainians against Russia. I mean, what do you think about this? Well, I think that that, that last point is exactly the issue here that that, you know, the United States is happy to have proxy wars. Uh, we're happy to have a situation where somebody else pays the price. This is what we're doing in, in Ukraine. Uh, you know, the U.S. pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed with NATO until Russia finally reached a point where they felt that they had to take, you know, countermeasures. Uh, and that's a that's a, a rough situation. It's a it's a very, very unpleasant situation, obviously, one that China has been very consistent in calling for negotiation and calling for resolving this, you know, on a, on a diplomatic basis. But it's one that that basically it was was structured and, and created by the U.S. and the expansion of NATO. But it what it does is it gives the United States the opportunity to have uh, Ukrainians uh, you know, getting killed and having their cities destroyed and, and having all this uh, turmoil going on while Americans uh, sit home and, and, you know, watch it on TV or listen to it on NPR and, and wring their hands and worry about, you know, white refugees for once instead of all the people that we destroyed for 20 years in Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria. You know, it, the, 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 the double standards that we've seen around uh, the Ukraine situation are, are phenomenal. Now we see American politicians, you know, explicitly invoking Ukraine as a sort of parallel case to Taiwan, which is false on its on its fundamental premises, because Ukraine is a sovereign state. Uh, you know, this is a this is a dispute between uh, sovereign countries. It's a situation where if anybody is violating, uh, you know, <laughs> those fundamental principles, it's the U.S. and NATO with their constant pressure. But Taiwan is part of China, and the United States is formally, legally committed to that position. So to to ramp it up and say that, uh, you know, that, that we won't tolerate China taking Taiwan by force, Taiwan is already part of China, you know. And, and the government on the island, the local authorities on the island, uh, have the same position. So it's 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 a you know the the, the cognitive dissonance that, that that comes with this rhetoric uh, is 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 pretty serious. And again, I think it reflects the idea that the U.S. it's American politicians driving the tensions over Taiwan as a way of trying to 
put pressure on China, demonize China, constrain China's rise. Uh, and this is a very, very dangerous game for them to be playing. Yeah, no, I think that's a very good point, Ken. And, you know, of course, it also speaks to, to what you just said about, you know, trying to sort of hem China in. Blinken saying we're going to try to shape the strategic environment around China. And I think it gets to kind of a, a core issue here for Americans, which is should we actually fear China? Because I think that's really the underlying factor is it's like, well, if they're evil, shouldn't we be trying to constrain them and so on and so forth? So could you speak to that issue? Because to me, it feels like that's the root cause of it all. Like, I mean, should we fear them or is there scope for cooperation that is is unexplored currently? Well, there, there, there really ought to be. Uh, no, I mean, China has not, uh, it's not China that's ramping up the situation over Taiwan. China has not been saying, you know, we are so really just chomping at the bit. We want to get in there and, and mix it up and we're going to we're going to invade on a moment's note. That's not China saying that stuff. This is the United States. You know, we the U.S. has has really evolved over the last decade plus this kind of comprehensive anti-China campaign, whether it's these bogus charges of genocide in Xinjiang or the secret support that the uh, that the, uh, the, the National Endowment for Democracy, uh, you know, fed into the turmoil in Hong Kong or, you know, the provocations by the U.S. Navy in the South China Sea or in the Taiwan Strait. There's this comprehensive uh, uh, approach of trying to trying to contain and constrain China, trying to slow down China's development, its reemergence as a significant factor in global affairs. That's not going to work, but you know, that is what they're, that is what they're trying to do. And so, you know, to, to do that, they, they have to make China seem like the bad guys. China has to be the enemy. China has to be the one who's, who's, who's the aggressor. And we, and we hear that kind of language, but where are they aggressing? You know, they're, they're out there in the world. They're, they're engaged in a lot of international activities. They're taking part uh, in, in, in the global fight against COVID, against the pandemic. They're taking part in economic development in, in you know, many, many countries around the world on a, on a you know, a mutually beneficial basis. Uh, they're not, uh, you know, China historically has never been an expansive colonialist overseas, let us project our power kind of country. That's the United States. That's the European heritage. Western imperialism has shaped the world and wants to continue that shape. But that's not that's not going to be the way it is going forward. You know, China isn't, you know, rising up and becoming some aggressive superpower. China is simply returning to a role of significance, which it occupied for, for many, many centuries until Western imperialism disrupted that. You know, so so the idea that that China is the problem, of course, that's what politicians have to say. They can't say, well, we don't want the Chinese people to have greater prosperity. We don't want the Chinese people to you know, have a better healthcare system. We don't want the Chinese people to achieve technological innovation and, and, and develop their economy. You know, they can't say that, but that's exactly what they mean. But they spin it, you know, by saying, oh, evil China, scary China. It's the old yellow peril, red scare. We get to hear both of those messages again. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's sad. It's built on the fundamental reality that a lot of people in the United States don't really know much about China. And, and the media, which is in lockstep with, with you know, the elite politicians and the military, uh, just, just spout these lies, spout these stories. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're really busy right now pre-positioning their dismissal of the United Nations report on the situation in Xinjiang. They've already come out. You know, the uh, Bachelet hasn't even gotten out there yet. And the U.S. has already dismissed anything she could possibly say. You know, so uh, the China has to be the evil other out there. Uh, and that's that's just, uh, you know, that's why we have to talk about it. We have to be people that push back against that. Yeah, it's well said. I, I guess, like, lastly, Ken, I'd want to know, you know, how do you see the conflict in Ukraine uh, aside from how it might be having an impact on the way the U.S. views Taiwan? Um, or wants to use Taiwan. How do you see the conflict in, to, to, in in Ukraine impacting China's calculations in terms of how they might perceive their their ability to have a relationship with the U.S. when they see how far the U.S. has gone uh, sure, to try to sure. weaken well, Russia? I think, 
yeah, I think it's got to have a, a it, it's got to be having an influence on strategic thinkers in China uh, because it, it, it certainly demonstrates the not just the willingness but the eagerness of of uh, the U.S. and and its allies in in, uh, in NATO uh, to to pursue this kind of proxy campaign. If the U.S. can trigger uh, a conflict over Taiwan, if they if they could somehow push China far enough that 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 actual hostilities would break out you know it's not going to be the united states taking the hit it's going to be the people of taiwan it's going to be people in, in fujian province on the mainland uh, elsewhere uh, there are there are there 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 are books that have been published about this the council on foreign relations has has gotten jazzed up about this about how china can be made to pay a price uh, of course they're paying a price for something they haven't done but the idea is that that if they can trigger military conflict that could be escalated to the point where it would inflict severe damage on china and on taiwan but the united states thinks that it's going to walk away scot-free i don't think that that's an accurate assessment and i think that there are those in the military who are well aware of that i think that if if we if we cast our our our, our memory back to that point where uh, the chairman of the joint chiefs called his counterpart in china during that period where, where you know, we were having troubles with the election uh, at the end of, of 2020, beginning of 2021, and said, don't worry, we're not going to you know, launch an attack on you. He did that to defuse a situation which the military understands can be very problematic. You know? uh, and and, and I, don't think, I don't think a lot of people in the U.S. military want to go one-on-one -on -one with China. China has, has pursued uh, its own defense its own ability to to control its military environment in ways that uh, that I think have largely neutralized the ability of the U.S. to just sort of move move its pieces around on the chessboard. But, you know, we certainly don't want to see that get tested in reality, mm -hmm. even though a lot of American politicians seem willing and eager, if not able, to envision that. Mm hmm. Well, Dr. Ken Hammond, as always, it's a pleasure to have you with us, and we appreciate you coming on and giving us some of your time to help us sort through it all. Glad to be here. Call me anytime. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. And, yeah, I mean, it really is is amazing the level of new Cold War bellicosity, you know, that is <sighs> going into trying to destroy China. But we're going to switch gears here. We want to turn to Latin America, to Colombia, to, uh, well, what could be a very momentous election coming up here, uh, I believe on the 29th is the actual day itself, this upcoming weekend. And we are very honored to be joined for this conversation by our good friend, Zoe Alexandro, who's a journalist, co-editor of People's Dispatch, very relevant for this, lived and worked and continues to cover Columbia very closely. So the person we need to be talking to, Zoe, as always, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Well, uh, you know, maybe give us a sense of what the stakes are here in the Colombian elections. I, I think, you know, some people are following it. It's maybe the most, probably the most coverage in America Colombian elections gotten in a while, but I don't think people are hearing a lot about why this is so historic potentially. Um, so maybe just set the scene for us a bit. Definitely. I think it's it's super important to do this kind of historic recounting of what these elections really mean. It's not just an, another electoral process. We really have to look at the moment in history, the moment in time that these are taking place, the trajectory of Colombian politics up until now. And so and that with that being said, these are, of course, historic. Um, this is the first time in, you know, since in 60 years and in, in many, many decades that a progressive ticket has an actual chance of winning uh, Colombian elections. Um, Colombia was one of the countries where elites very early on saw that it was important, whether they were conservative, whether they were liberal, they had to make a pact and they made a pact. It was called the National Pact. So it was made in the 60s to basically bar any sort of people-centered, people-focused, working class possibility from arriving to office. This, uh, this national pact that was made between conservative and liberal elites um, was made after 10 years of the violence, the uprising that happened following the assassination of Jorge Eliezer Gaitan, um, where the liberals and conservatives uh, were fighting each other. 
And in order to stop, you know, the actual working class aspirations from making its way to the halls of power in Colombia, they created this pact. And of course, the pact didn't last until today. But in some senses, it really has because the country, unlike many of its neighbors, unlike many in the region, has never been ruled by any sort of progressive government. It has been ruled by governments that have favored the U.S. interest in the region. It is home to seven U.S. military bases. Um, it has some of the most lenient laws regarding mineral extraction, oil extraction, um, very unfavorable policies for its large peasant population, a country with extremely lenient labor laws um, where workers have essentially no rights, a privatized healthcare system, privatized higher education. And this is precisely due to this dominance of neoliberal conservative politics in Colombia. So that being said, the fact that the ticket of the historic pact, and it's called historic pact because it really is historic, it's bringing together progressive forces from across the spectrum, from traditional left forces in the country, new social movements, some disgruntled members of the liberal party of more liberal sections of uh, Colombia's politics. And they're coming together in the historic pact that's led by Gustavo Petro, who I think we're seeing right now on the screen, and Francia Marquez. These two are extremely emblematic of this historic pact. Gustavo Petro, a former member of the M19 guerrilla, has had experience in electoral politics since he uh, demobilized from the group, since the group demobilized. He was mayor of Bogota. He oversaw an administration that you know, saw great advances in social policies in the city, where there were a lot of education programs, a lot of work employment programs, policies that really can see um, that how that would transform into a national level. Francia Marquez is a land defender, human rights defender, comes from the Afro-Colombian movement. She works very closely with peasant movements, urban movements, women's movements. She really represents these sectors that have been coming out onto the streets for the past decade demanding social changes, demanding structural changes, saying no to the violence, saying no to the armed conflict. The image we're seeing now on the screen is of a campaign rally on Saturday when Francia Marquez uh, received, uh, was pointed out with a laser, um, direct threat to her life, bodyguards had to cover up her with shields. This speaks to the, the gravity of what this historic pack ticket represents all of the aspirations of the working people in Colombia finally trying to break through and emerge from these decades of conservative policy of anti-people policies that have submerged Colombia into a country where there's high levels of unemployment, um, one of the countries with the highest number of massacres, human rights defenders being assassinated. Um, so that's kind of the general picture. So with all that said, obviously the elites are not going to let this happen easily, right? So in the lead up to this election, you mentioned some death threats um, against one of the candidates. What are the ways that, that these people are being pushed back against by that sort of like entrenched, powerful right-wing elite that has been in charge of the country since its inception? For sure. I mean, on one hand, we see the direct death threats from actual active paramilitary organizations in the country. So these are not death threats that are coming, um, you know, just from online anonymous Twitter bots. These are death threats that are coming from paramilitary groups that are active in the territories of Colombia that are linked to drug trafficking groups. Gustavo Petro had to uh, suspend his campaign activities for a couple of days following one of these death threats that came from one of these groups. Francia Marquez has been targeted really through her whole life as an activist by some of these groups. These have, of course, increased exponentially since she was uh, selected to be the vice presidential candidate. Um, we saw this direct threat to her life that happened on Saturday, but there have been many um, communiques been released by, for example, one of the groups, groups Aguilas Negras, the Black Eagles, they have been threatening her. Um, most recently in this past week, there's been a very intensified fake news campaign against Francia, against Gustavo Petro. One of the uh, sort of ridiculous cases that, uh, of this is that a woman pretending to be Francia's daughter 
said that um, Francia's politics about Afro-Colombians and the need to have representational politics for this community that has been so marginalized, so oppressed through Colombia's history is, is false and that she's being a victim. Saying all of these things against Francia and her candidacy, turns out Francia comes out with a statement, she doesn't have any daughters, she has two sons, and this video is going viral in Colombia, slanderizing Francia, and it's completely fictitious. So all of these types of multi-pronged uh, campaign, and then of course you have uh, you know right-wing politicians saying that uh, Gustavo Petro and Francia are Castro Chavista, that they want to make Colombia Venezuela, and many people have said, what could be worse? What could happen? That's all. That's worse than what's already happening in Colombia. What can get worse than the fact that over 1,200 human rights defenders and social leaders have been assassinated since the peace agreements were signed? What could be worse that children are dying from hunger, are dying because of poverty, they're being evicted from their homes, they're being forced to displace themselves because of paramilitary violence? What could be worse than this? So this comparison saying that they're going to plunge the country into chaos, it's already in chaos. There's already violence. What could really, you know, and so it's this horrible politics of fear that the Colombian right uses time after time. They did this during the peace agreements. They're continuing to do it today. And it's just horrible because they don't care about the lives of the people. They don't want policies that are going to promote the inclusion of all of the marginalized groups in society. They don't want to give people education. They don't want to give them access to health care. So it's really relying on this negative rhetoric, criticizing the opposition, saying that they're horrible people. And at the end of the day, it's just so they can maintain control of their land, control of their resources and control of their you know, interests in the region. You know, I think some of this may have been implied, but I did want to ask directly, Zoe, about the program of the Historic Pact and some of the things that they're planning on bringing in, because it has inspired, you know, it is historic, I think a politics of hope that is is, is really rising in a major way. So what are some of the things that they have proposed they would do if they're able to come in to power in Colombia? So there's a variety of things. I think one of some of the key elements have to do with respecting some of the previous agreements and previous accords that have been made with different groups in the country. For example, um, in the peace agreements, there's very clear policies laid out that have been not respected by the current government of Ivan Duque, programs that have been underfunded, land reform programs, programs of the transition for uh, these fighters. So there's a lot of, there's an element of respecting what the state has already agreed to. Um, for example, fracking, which uh, Colombian, which has really been a big debate in the country, um, banning these sorts of really destructive environmental policies that have destroyed the environment in Colombia. As I mentioned, Colombia has very rich uh, resource wealth, um, which transnational corporations have basically pillaged uh, for their own benefit. And so one of the key pillars is transitioning away from this uh, destructive policies of just taking all these resources out of the country, giving them to foreign companies, um, looking towards developing the agricultural sector, um, ensuring access to education. Uh, there is uh, accessible public education in the country, but it's very prohibitive to enter because a lot of these universities are test-based. Um, when Alvaro Uribe Vélez was president, not only did he oversee a campaign of sort of extermination of the left, but he also privatized the healthcare care uh, in the country. And so I think the guarantee of these basic rights, uh, the, the slogan of Francia Marquez is vivir sabroso, which means riv, live richly, live with dignity, live with joy, live with hope and meeting the needs of these marginalized populations, trying to rectify the historic wrongs against Colombia's people through decades of armed conflict and, um, you know, the counterinsurgency policies that have been supported by the U.S. government, the war on drugs, which has seen the destruction of people's livelihoods. And so really it's making making right with all of these wrongs. Mm -hmm. Well, Zoe, you know, Zoe is, oh, sorry, for, those, 
Well, I just wanted to ask real quick, you know, for those of us who want to follow along on Sunday as these elections are taking place, I know there's going to be lots of people on the ground kind of like giving updates and providing monitoring in case there's any attempts to, you know, try to make sure that certain people don't get to vote. So where should people follow along so they can see what's happening in Colombia? Well, there's going to be a lot of different, um, for Spanish media, there's a lot of different journalists on the ground. Uh, we'll, we at People's Dispatch will definitely be providing updates. Um, there were actually, it's important to mention, there were a couple electoral observers that were actually banned from the country that were de detained and deported. Uh, Terry Matson of Code Pink, several other electoral observers from Latin America. So actually, this is a key important point as well. Um, but I would follow along at People's Dispatch. Um, I know that uh, Colombian Forma from Colombia is a really great source. Um, Kausasha News, I know they're going to be following closely. Um, and uh, there's a numerous of other uh, media organizations in Colombia that people can check out. Um, and definitely important to stay tuned, stay alert, and support the Colombians, Colombians people, you know, restoration of democracy. Mm -hmm. Well, Zoe, as always, I appreciate it. Very, very comprehensive. And I think, you know, certainly this is going to be very interesting to see on Sunday. And hopefully we'll be able to bring you back and talk about positive things and a momentous change in Colombia. But yes, follow People's Dispatch. Couldn't recommend it more highly. Zoe Alexandra is the co-editor. Thank you so much for giving us a piece of, you, of some of your time. Ooh. <laughs> no problem. Always great to be with you guys. Thank you. Well, you know, hopefully this will be some good news. I mean, a lot to watch out for, possibility of voter fraud, uh, know, possibility of crossed, violence. Though, fingers but, yeah, crossed, though, fingers crossed. Huge. It's hard to really understand yeah. how big this would be to get these you know, narco dictators out of there. So mm -hmm. we'll keep watching it. But we want to move to another issue, very, very important issue. That is the issue of reproductive rights and health care here in the United States. Obviously, the rights of women are very much under attack. And, of course, there's the potentiality, at least, of this looming Supreme Court decision that would eliminate the a woman's right to choose. So we are very happy to be joined as we delve into all this by Karina Garcia, who's an organizer with the Party for Socialism and Liberation and an organizer that I must say has 10 years of experience working with immigrant communities around access to reproductive health care. Karina Garcia, thank you so much for being with us here on the show. Thank you for having me. Well, you know, Karina, I think this is a, it seems like an inflection point moment. Uh, we, we're seeing not only the Supreme Court decision, but, you know, all of the, these, you know, similar ridiculous bigoted individuals who are trying to take advantage of it. Oklahoma passing this new law that I think is banning abortion from the moment of fertilization. I mean, it's almost beyond parody. And it seems, I think, to many people that it's a, almost a foregone conclusion that these rights are just gone and and there's really nothing that can be done, the courts, the politicians, whatever. So I, I'm curious your thoughts about that because I think it seems like one of those moments where well, I don't know. I'm editorializing. So anyway, I'm just curious your thoughts about that and kind of the framing I think we're getting from a lot of the media discussion about it. You know, it's it's been a hard few days just, you know, with everything that's happening. You all talked about what happened in Texas earlier. And, it, you know, it's just uh, I think that we have to win our rights the way that we got them to begin with. And I think we have to remember how powerful we really are. We understand what is happening right now. We understand that this is a government that has provided no solutions to the problems that millions of people, the vast majority of this population, is suffering right now, from joblessness to lack of health care, the housing crisis, child poverty. There's like all sorts of problems, solvable problems, that they should be working on, that they should be focused on, that they should be providing solutions to. And instead, what they're doing is they're sitting on their hands and they're allowing a tiny uh, group of people to threaten the lives of half the population and in fact more than half the population because the majority of people who have abortions are moms, right? That means they already know what it's like to have a family in this country. They already are living day to day thinking about these mass shootings and no solution in sight, thinking about the climate crisis and no solution in sight, thinking about all of these solvable problems. And it seems that the only thing that this government is capable of doing is providing arms and weapons and starting new wars abroad. When it comes to providing for people's needs and funding education and health care and child care, all of the stuff that was laid out in that American Families Act, 
that, of course, didn't pass, that was a bare minimum, really, of what people deserve, then it's filibuster. Oh, we can't do anything. Our hands are tied. But when it comes to starting new wars, then they have all the money in the world. You talked about it in your show, Eugene. Then they can pass billions of dollars with a majority, with a so quickly, so effective, all of a sudden they become when it comes to starting new wars. We've had enough. We've heard it all before. And what's important for people in the movement now is to go back to our roots, our fight. We're going to win our rights the way we won them to begin with, fighting, building our organizations, not tailing the Democratic Party, not wasting our time fundraising for them, and certainly not thinking that lobbying them is going to be the way that we're going to win back our rights. Ooh, <laughs> that's the kind of fire we need to hear. Well said. No, well said. Because I think I think right now so many people see what's happening with these kinds of issues, particularly around the issue of abortion access. And it does feel like Eugene said this foregone conclusion. We're gonna lose this right. Everyone just give up and spend all your time. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna do anything, just put some money into some group that can help get people out. But now we see there's these laws that are being passed where it's criminalizing anybody who even leaves the state to go and get an abortion and then come back can be like criminally charged. So I guess my question for you, everything you said is so important and so true, but my question for you is what is the answer? Like what should people be doing? I'm not saying don't donate to organizations yeah. that no. can help people who need to get out of the state and go get an sure. abortion, but beyond that, what can we do? I think that this is a moment we have to put them on the defensive. We have to put them on the defensive. How is it that they provide no solutions for people, that they can't do the bare minimum for working families, and that they want to force us to bring more kids into this, this, this country? It's, we have to put them on the defensive. We have to talk about the, the things that they don't want to talk about. They don't want to talk about the failure of this government to pass any meaningful legislation for millions of working families who are suffering for no reason because we live in the richest country in the world and we have all of the resources now to provide people with living wages, with health care, with education, all of the things that they need. They can send a billionaire to space. They can send drones all over the planet to start new wars, but they can't send people masks. They can't send people test kits. This government is a complete failure. It's a complete failure. And what we need to do is come back to our roots. We have to organize in our communities. We have to talk to people. Don't waste your money sending it to the Democratic politicians. They're not going to do anything that they haven't done already. They've been able to do it, and they've chosen not to. So let's get on the streets, and let's bring out, let's fight for what we deserve. That's how we've always won rights in this country. That's the only way we've ever won anything that you can rely on. It's because we've been out in the streets organizing our communities. It's a failed strategy what many large reproductive rights organizations have had for a long time of thinking that they can just be friends and then make excuses for these politicians. No, we're not making any excuses for them and we're not wasting another penny or another nickel of our integrity or time on those people. If they want our votes, they should earn them. Do something right now. Don't wait until November. Pass the women's health protection right now. The filibuster is bullshit. They, it's a rule that they have that is not in the Constitution. They can end it. They can abolish it. And in fact, there are people who are calling for that. Do it now. It's not a foregone conclusion that it's over. They can pass the Women's Health Protection Act and all of this stuff that people are worried about could end like that. And that's not the only thing. We actually are paying attention to what's happening and we're studying our history. We've learned from the last movement that we can't go, stop building our own organizations and fighting for the things that we want. We can't because that's the way that they are able to, to do all of the damage that they have. We can't wait for them. We have to do it ourselves. We have to fight for the things that we deserve and unite the things. We're not gonna stop at abortion rights and we're not gonna stop at until we have all the things we deserve, until our families are living with dignity and with support and with resources and God damn it, we could do those things. And so why should we let these tiny group of millionaires use all of our resources to put us into a nuclear war? All of our people need to stand up. These are the moments right now to get out there and talk to people and organize and protest and strike and build their own organizations. It's not over. Uh, no, I, I don't even know what to say. You're right. I, that's all I know how to say. I mean, I, I think that's, that's, that's right on point. I think it, it points to, you know, all of the different pieces. And I'm glad you mentioned the thing about the Democrats. I, I don't think we need to belabor it. I think your point was very clear, but I think it's, it's we've seen, 
the level of cynicism, you know, I mean, we saw, of course, in Jessica Cisneros' race, you know, she's running against the, this, this, you know, anti-abortion, pro-NRA guy, and, you know, you have this Supreme Court thing come down, and you have Nancy Pelosi recording robocalls. I mean, it just felt like a slap in the face, salt in the wound, yeah. insult to injury sort of, sort of piece to it. And, and I wanted to raise that not specifically because of the Democrats, but specifically because of the context, which I know you know a lot about, which is South Texas, on the border, you know, deeply impoverished population. Uh, there's many things I could say, obviously heavily, uh, you know, Chicano population and so much happening in that area. And, and I raise it because I think there are some people who want to create the perception that, you know, this issue of a reproductive health care is simply just a white women's issue. And, you know, it's not it's it's not a movement that is is inclusive of working class people. And I thought that race was so indicative of, you know, one, how that's false. Uh, but I think it's an important issue. And I know you've worked a lot on this, you know, over the years. And I was hoping you could just address that, because I think when we talk about uniting people, it's an important thing that I, I hear, unfortunately, you know, on the Internet and places like that. And I hate to even give it credence, but I, I think it's important to address. Yeah, I. And I want to say I'm sorry. I'm sorry, and I'm not sorry because I get so mad as we're talking about this. But I no, think it's important. No, it's the right attitude. You can be mad and stay mad, and use your anger, that righteous anger that you have, to talk to other people, to get out in the streets, to protest, and build the movement. And about the Rio Grande Valley, this is something that people don't know, may not know as much about. There's a strong history of organizing, of left, communist, socialist organizing in the Rio Grande Valley farm workers, domestic workers, and these people's organizations have been able to survive and to thrive in ways that it are unbelievable, you know, the amount of, of things that our people are able to withstand, the amount of oppression and exploitation that our people have been able to withstand and push back, it is an isolated place and it has its different barriers, but the people are fighting. And I think that the, to the extent that those, the, the people have you know, sort of given up, or I don't want to even say given up their power, but like sort of said, okay, like let's let these politicians do the job. That's where we start to lose the most. To the extent that we get sucked into the Democratic Party's lies, that's where we get, that's where we lose. But the organizations that I've seen of people, the way that they fight for each other, whether that's because there's raids or whether that's because they're fighting for stolen wages or the conditions of farm workers, that history, we have to go back to that history. That's the way that we win things in this country. That's the way that we make changes. So I think the idea that this is like a white middle class women's issue, that's of course nonsense, right? We know that the people who are gonna suffer and are, have suffered from this are poor and working class women because no matter what happens, we can't just like fly away to some other place. Like rich women, women with means, they'll be able to go somewhere else and get their abortions and da -da -da, whatever it is. But working class women don't have that luxury. We're gonna be here. But you know what also? That not having that luxury gives you something too. It gives you courage and fight, you know? Like it's not just about having money and resources. It's about standing up for yourself and standing up for your community and demanding the things that you deserve. And for that, you don't need any money. You don't need any money. You need courage. And we have that. And we know how to survive. And we're gonna survive. All those organizations that are in the border, they're organizing with women in Mexico too. And the women in Mexico 10 years ago were where we are right now. But they learned, and we're learning from them, the way that they are able to legalize abortion in Mexico is because they've been fighting in the streets. And they've been organizing themselves. And they've been helping each other. They've been giving themselves pills and sending with each other and coming along with each other, acompañándolas. They've been helping each other. And that's the lessons that we're going to take, too. That's what they don't want, but that's what we're going to do. We are learning from our comrades, our people in Latin America and Argentina and Mexico about how it is that you actually secure rights. We're learning from Cubans how it is that you secure a society with dignity that respects you and your family, that actually puts your resources for your survival, for your people, for your sovereignty. We're learning those things, and that's not, they can't take that away. You know, it's so interesting, all the countries you mention, it's, it does seem to be quite an indicator uh, in this, I guess, century, uh, the progress a country is making on a social level when abortion is legalized or decriminalized or made accessible. And it is pretty striking how all of these countries in the global South, that many of which you just mentioned, uh, that many in the U.S. are 
taught to think of as like backwards or like, you know, more conservative and less progressive. It's like we're seeing the opposite happen right now. We're actually seeing the U.S. like regress quite dramatically. And that's to even I mean, even if we want to pretend the U.S. ever was progressive in any way, it never really was. But it is does seem to be regressing and moving backwards while a lot of other countries in the world are moving forward. It's more of a comment than a question, but it's just kind of a striking irony. Definitely. I mean, I think what we can take from that as, as organizers and people who are fighting is to not have the arrogance of our ruling class, not believe, not think that we can't learn from other people's struggles from other parts of the world, not having that arrogance at all, and looking at the world how it is, and thinking about our reality how it actually is, not believing the media, what they tell us, but seeing what are the conditions of our communities, what are the things that are happening, and we know that there are resources. And so our communities, our people are suffering for no reason. And that needs to stop. And that's why we can't just stop at abortion rights. We're fighting for socialism. We want socialism in our lifetime. We want people to be treated with housing, health care, education, all the things that they deserve that we can provide, not only for this country, but for the entire world. That's what we want. And so now they've made a big mistake by coming and with the arrogance that they always do. They overstep, <laughs> and now it's going to make it worse for them. Well, Karina, you know, we introduced you as an organizer for the Party Socialism, for, for Socialism and Liberation. I know you're also part of a collective that puts out a great magazine, Breaking the Chains. I, I think, you know, people who are looking out here wondering where to turn. I mean, what are some of the places they can go, they should look, get started in, on their own journey to stand up and fight back? Join the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Check out our publications, Breaking the Chains. Um, start organizing wherever you are. If we don't have a branch there, we'll start a group there. And talk to us pslweb.org we want to know you we want to fight alongside you and and if you're not in a city where there's something exists then make it exist but the time is now but mm -hmm. we do have to move quickly mm -hmm. well i i think probably there are many people who are ready to fight alongside you now really appreciate you giving yeah. us much of your valuable time here today and just helping us sort through all these thank issues you, again karina garcia thank you. thank you so much for joining us here in the thank Freedom you Center. love you guys thank you so much Ooh, I'm fired up. No, I'm I'm a hundred percent fired up with that. There, you know, it's a family show, so apologies to anyone who has their their kids out here. But you know, Karina has a daughter who watches this show, so she she's okay with it. Okay <laughs> That's true. It. Yeah. Uh, but no, I, I think all the points she made were a hundred percent true. I mean, nothing is given to you. Uh, at least when it comes to rights for oppressed and exploited people, everything is taken from powerful people. So if you want it. Sure as hell ain't going to get it from Nancy Pelosi and these people. And also, I mean, yeah. I like the connection mansion. to socialism, too. Yeah. Well, I like the connection to socialism, too, because this is, this is like a, an issue that isn't just standing alone. It's connected to all these other issues uh, that come from, you know, the greed of capitalism, yeah. not having access to health care, not having access to education, all of these things that people are, everyone is really being denied by the richest country in the world because it steals from everywhere else in the world, but you know, that's an aside. But the True. point is, um, the point is, is I, I like the fact that she framed it as like, this was a real big mistake because now there's all these other issues we're just gonna have to raise. Mm -hmm. So I like that. I like connecting the idea of abortion access to all of these yeah. other issues that socialism can solve. Well, there's a Cuban that phrase note. that says, turn every <laughs> defeat into a victory. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, this will be an interesting to see how this plays out. And, and we'll have to see. People are already in the streets and doing things. It's not a foregone conclusion about the Supreme Court. Let's see what happens. Um, but either way, I think there's a path forward. But as always, this brings us to the end of the show, Rania. And it does. to some degree, a sad time because we are separated uh, by a large <laughs> ocean. So it's our only time together. Is, but nevertheless... Uh, very happy to have had everyone with us. Want to remind people not to forget, you can go to patreon.com slash breakthrough news. That's patreon.com slash breakthrough news. Become a patron, support us. All of your patronage is deeply, deeply appreciated, no matter what you can do. Yep. Very happy to have your support. And of course, don't forget that you can subscribe on YouTube. You can hit the bell so you get the alerts. So not only are you subscribing, but you are also getting the most up-to-date information about all the fantastic things, including dispatches from Rania Kalik. And the punch out from Eugene Perrier. <laughs> Eugene, I have to add something to this Patreon pitch. Please. Um, 
It's a, it would make a great birthday gift. Uh, I, it's my birthday. In you ruined my surprise. My I was going to tell people happy birthday to Rania. Oh my God. Oh. Oh, I was yeah, I was gonna I was gonna use I was gonna invoke my birthday to well there's still to forty guilt minutes. people into becoming patrons <laughs> <laughs> to guilt people you should listen if you like me and my birthday if you want to wish me a happy birthday thank you oh there's even a lower third for me thank you so much if you want to wish me a happy birthday become a patron of Breakthrough News that's that's Perfect. all I wanted to thank you know <laughs> yeah right that's a good pitch. Thank you. It's that a great really pitch. Genuine. It's a great pitch. And it, <laughs> definitely, I think that would be a fantastic birthday gift. It would be great for all of us to receive. It's kind of a gift yes. for everybody. I like to, it's a collective but, birthday. I like to make my birthday collective. <laughs> well, of course, big <laughs> thanks to our whole Breakthrough News team who makes the show possible. Very happy to be back with you. And as always, we will see you next week. Thank you.